So I wanted to make a quick video going over the amino acids and their structures. And I think this is a very important thing to learn for the uh, MEMCAT because it's going to be heavily tested. They uh, included the amino acids in the new administration of the, of the test and a lot of people didn't learn their structures and names and uh, one letter codes. And so they regret that after. So I just wanted to go over the general structure where you're going to find these amino acids and how you can learn exactly what they do. So as far as general structure goes, you have an amino group attached to an alpha carbon, which is attached to a carboxyl group. And that alpha carbon right here in the center, so that would be all of these right here, have a hydrogen and an R group. And the R group, R group is what tells you exactly what the amino acid is. It gives you the identity of the amino acid. So in the case of glycine, the R group is actually another H. So there are two hydrogens coming off. It's not shown here. Two hydrogens coming off this carbon, and that actually makes this glycine a chiral. And we'll talk about that in a second. So you have an amino group, an alpha carbon, and a carboxyl group. And attached to that alpha carbon, you're going to have one hydrogen and one R group. So the important thing to note about a lot of these diagrams of amino acids is that um, this one in particular, all of these actually aren't entirely accurate. And the reason why they're not accurate is because it depicts a protonated carboxyl group and a deprotonated amino group. And as we know, it's much more difficult to deprotonate an amino group than it is a, a carboxyl group. So in nature, in order to find this, um, you would have to be you, I mean, you, you can't find this. This, is, this doesn't exist in nature. And so we know that the pKa of a carboxyl group is somewhere around 2. So you would have to be below 2 to have this, but above 9 to have this right here. So you have to be above 9 to deprotonate this amino group, but somehow below 2 at the same time to have this be protonated. So this is, this is not correct. So to fix this, you could just add a hydrogen to that nitrogen right there, and then that would make this NH3+, plus, and then you'd be done. So a note about chirality that I talked about briefly uh, when I was talking about glycine is that all 20 amino acids that are proteinogenic, so those are the ones that are incorporated into proteins during translation, are chiral, so um, except glycine, right? And the reason why glycine is not chiral is because it has two hydrogens, like I said, and when you have two of the same atoms attached to a carbon, you cannot have chirality. So this would be achiral. So um, of the 19 that are chiral, 18 of them are in the S conformation, and um, one of them is R. And that one that is R is cysteine right here. The reason why cysteine is R is because it has a sulfur which has a high priority in the con ingold prelog uh, rules. So that would, that would give this an R. The rest of the chiral amino acids, threonine, tyrosine, you name it, they are S. So that's as far as the SR convention goes, name and convention, you also have the L and D, which is one that biochemists prefer. And um, of the L and D nomenclature, all the chiral ones that are found, you know, naturally occurring are L. So that would mean that in a Fischer projection, you would have the nitrogen, the amino group on the left side, you'd have the alpha carbon, and then you'd have the carboxyl group on the right side. So the way that uh, Fischer projections work is that they are compared to glyceraldehyde. And do that comparison, um, you can see whether it be L or R, or D, sorry, L or D. Okay. So there are a few major groupings for amino acids. This table like to put the aromatic amino acids in their own separate category. I don't know if I like that. I like to um, put phenylalanine and tryptophan under the nonpolar. So instead of uh, nonpolar, they put an aliphatic, aliphatic group, which just means it doesn't have um, an aromatic ring. So these two, I would say, are nonpolar. And these are just general rules. They're not entirely true for every single scenario, but I don't think the MCAT is going to deviate from that. So you can just use that as a general rule. So these would be nonpolar right here. Tyrosine I like to include with the polar uncharged. So that, that would be this group. 
right here, starting from serine down. So this, this is the polar uncharged group. And then up here, you have the polar charged groups. So of course, everything that is charged is going to be polar because it likes to interact with water, right? This negative charge can um, interact with that hydrogen of the water molecule because that hydrogen has a partial positive charge due to the strong electronegativity of oxygen. And um, those interactions are really good in uh, stabilization terms. So also these, so these are acidic amino acids, aspartate and glutamate are uh, acidic, uh, acidic, and arginine, histidine, and lysine are basic. And the reason why these have their uh, conventions is because these two amino acids like to donate protons, and they do it very easily. And they do that because they have carboxyl groups, in addition to that carboxyl that is common to every amino acid. They have an extra carboxyl group. And these two amino acids actually only differ by one carbon right here. So aspartate has one carbon, glutamate has two over here. So as far as these amino acids go, um, they like to interact with ions as well. So these two would interact with positive ions. These three would interact with negative ions and they can actually interact with each other. And these interactions are called salt bridges. So as far as the basic amino acids go, arginine, histidine, lysine, they generally have a positive charge somewhere, and that's because these amino groups like to pick up hydrogens, right? The, the lone pair on the, on the amino group is a nucleophile that's going to attack the electrophilic H plus in solution, and you get uh, that, that bond right there, which would make this positively charged, right? So you're going to find these amino acids mainly in the exterior of a protein interacting in the aqueous uh, environment. So either sticking out into the extracellular space or within the cytosol, or something like that. These amino acids, on the other hand, so these aliphatic ones and um, these two aromatic ones right here, are going to be mainly in the interior of the protein. And that's because they don't like to interact with water. They're hydrophobic, which means water-fearing, right? So these are going to be inside. So from here, from alanine to tryptophan, these amino acids are going to be found in the interior of proteins. And from tyrosine on, you're going to find these in the exterior, interacting with water and other polar substances. So our last group is our polar uncharged. And the reason why they're uncharged is because they are not acids or bases for the most part. I'll just, you know, use that as a rule. So serine, threonine, cysteine, thionine, asparagine, and glutamine are not acidic or basic. Um, so they're going to they're gonna keep their neutral charge, their overall neutral charge in this, this depiction. So actually at physiological pH, which is around 7.4, these will be found in their Zwitter ionic form, which means that they have a both plus charge and a minus charge on the same molecule, but they cancel out and they give it a neutral. And you'll get a plus charge because this will be protonated, like I said, and this would be deprotonated at 7.4. Okay, so these two um, have OHs, which means that they're great hydrogen bonding candidates. And then these two are special, I guess, because they have sulfur in them. Cysteine likes to form disulfide bonds. Um, that happens when the sulfur gets oxidized and forms another bond with another sulfur, with another cysteine moiety, and that is called cystine. So you get oxidation from cysteine to cystine. So whenever you're losing a hydrogen, organic chemists like to call, like to call that oxidation. Whenever you gain hydrogen, uh, organic chemists like to call that reduction. All right. So as far as these two go, asparagine and glutamine, I think they're important because they look very similar to aspartic acid and glutamic acid, and they only actually differ in the fact that these are amides, and instead of these, which are uh, carboxylic acids, right? So these, instead of having that O at the end, it has an NH2, which would make this an amide, right? Carbonyl plus an NH2 is an amide, and but as far as that goes, that's the only real difference, right? They still have asparagine; still has only one 
between that alpha and carbon, right? Same with aspartic acid and glutamic acid. They look very similar, right? Just that amide, which is different. And that isn't allowed to be charged anymore, right? This is not a proton donor or acceptor. So that's, that's as far as it goes for the 20 amino acids. I would just recommend making flashcards, studying them. You're going to have, what, two, three months to study for the exam. If you start early and you make your flashcards and you just look at them every day, you're not going to need to look at them that, that many times. So um, it, it won't be too difficult. And once you have that down, it's down. So you don't have to worry about it anymore. And then you can use that on the test.